West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Joining us now is California Congressman Adam Schiff of California. He is the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee. He led today's hearing of the January 6th investigation. Sir, uh, I know this has been a big day. Uh, Thank you very much for taking time to be with us here tonight. Good to be with you. It is my um, estimation, having very closely watched today's hearing, that there were four main points um, that you brought forward. The first, and I think most prominent, the most important of those, is that you explained how President Trump personally took part in cajoling and trying to persuade people to overturn election results in the states. He then personally took part in escalating from that to new tactics that would bring threats of violence and intimidation against those same targets. And we saw that, I think, in in stark detail today. Is that the main point that you and your co-investigators wanted to convey today? Yes, uh, really just how premeditated it all was, Uh, how it started with a big lie that the president was told over and over and over again by his attorney general, a deputy, by his U.S. attorney in Georgia, by others, uh, was a big lie. But but that didn't matter. Uh, He used that big lie as a bludgeon uh, to try to get uh, the state legislators and elections officials to bend to his will to overturn the election. But uh, but he ran into resistance by courageous public servants who said, no, I'm not going to violate my oath. You may be the president, uh, you may be the head of my party, but there's something more important to me, uh, and that's my oath, and and that's my faith. Uh, And I'm I'm glad the public got to see these heroic people. Mm. Congressman Nicole Wallace, um, violence and it's Donald Trump's proximity to it, whether it's with Mike Pence um, or with the... Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers has been a constant theme and the committee has gone farther than anyone else ever has to putting him not just adjacent to the violence but cheering for the violence, indifferent to the consequences of the violence. Does this story deepen? I mean, do you have evidence that puts Donald Trump in the command and control position over the violence meted out by the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers and the other insurrectionist groups? Well, you know, I don't want to get ahead of uh, our committee presentations, uh, but, you know, I think that uh, one of the hearings where we explore what the president was doing, what he was saying and what he was thinking while the violence goes on goes to this very point. Uh, It goes to the point of of dereliction of duty, goes to the point that uh, that he he incited this violence, he incited this hatred, uh, he riled up this base, and, and then what did he do while it was happening? He sat back and watched it, watched it all play out. Uh, And, uh, you know, to see uh, today the human consequences of that, just a small part of it, these election workers uh, in Atlanta who were just going about their job, who had no idea they were about to be hit with a club 
uh, this this false claim, the likening of what they did to to drug deals. I mean, it's just disgusting. And you see how people's lives were turned up to, upside down, and ultimately uh, how lives were lost on January 6th. Hi, Congressman Ari here. You have this evidence of all these different people uh, submitting false electors, including potentially to the government. Um, do you view this as something where s- some, one or more people have broken the law through that act alone? Well, I, I share the view um, of Judge Carter in California that uh, this plot to overturn the election, which had many facets, likely violated multiple uh, federal laws and uh, and likely implicated the president of the United States. Um, you know, whether one specific aspect or another uh, violated a particular statute, I will have to leave to the Department of Justice. But I certainly believe there's more than enough evidence for them to investigate uh, each of the crimes that Judge Carter uh, set out. Uh, and I think the more evidence that we presented uh, just strengthens the case uh, for a federal investigation. Congressman, I'm just going to jump in real quick here with a follow on Ari's question. Uh, I just wanted to ask you about the response from Senator Ron Johnson of Wisconsin today after this uh, sort of p- p- his connection to this part of the plot was aired today in in the hearing. Uh, Senator Johnson said today that he was aware that his office had received the forged certificates, these fake slates of electors, but he says he doesn't know who delivered them. Um, that struck us all here on the panel as odd because if you got something from somebody you don't know who, the first instinct wouldn't be that you volunteer to hand deliver it to the vice president on January 6th. Um, but that's what he says. He says he doesn't even know where he got them from. He was just a courier. Does that jive with what you and the committee understand about Senator Johnson's involvement? Well, you know, I can't go into, uh, you know, what the, com- the committee's evidence or understanding is. Um, I have watched that same clip uh, with a lot of uh, interest today as Senator Johnson essentially said that he knew that something had arrived in the office. His chief of staff uh, was being asked to deliver it to uh, or being asked to help uh, convey it to the vice president. Uh, this is January 6th we're talking about and the idea uh, that he wouldn't know what it was or anything about it um, I think uh, begs a lot of uh, questions. Congressman, this is Joy Reid. I actually have a question about a senator as well, (laughs) as as, as Rachel did. Um, But it's about kind of the dog that didn't hunt today. Um, As I was watching the hearings today, I kept waiting to hear one name that I didn't, and that is Senator Lindsey Graham, um, who we do know from the reporting also put pressure on uh, Brad Raffensperger and others in the state of Georgia Mm -hmm. um, to hand Donald Trump the votes, you know, the flip the votes that he needed in order to win that election. Can you talk a little bit about your process, about who was included and who was not included? And will we hear more about um, Senator Graham's involvement in this pressure campaign on particularly the state of Georgia? Well, you know, in terms of the process, uh, as you might imagine, uh, there's a volume of evidence, a mountain of evidence to try to communicate through each of these hearings, uh, which, you know, are only lasting between two and three hours. Uh, And so we have to kind of ruthlessly say what's most important to convey to the public. Uh, And that means a lot hits the cutting room floor. Uh, Now, ultimately, we intend to open up and release uh, our files and let the public know uh, uh, the much bigger volume of what we have obtained. Uh, I can't tell you exactly when that's going to happen, but uh, we do intend to share uh, a lot that we couldn't cover in these hearings. Uh, but yes, some very difficult decisions are made uh, with each of these hearings. What is most important, knowing that we can't convey it all or even, even more than a small fraction. It is Wednesday. The 22nd of June of 2022, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog continues to be our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Smothered Benedict Wednesdays Will No One Rid Us of These Meddlesome Priests, Especially the Ones on the Supreme Court. Wow. Now, a separation of church and state is against the Constitution. Even though I've got, yes, here it comes, Jefferson's letter to the Danbury Baptist right here. But I suppose 
that the priests, and I don't mean that uh, in hyperbole. I mean that as a fact. I think the priests on the Supreme Court have determined that Jefferson was nothing but an atheist uh, won't commie. So don't listen to him. Jeez. And anyway, precedent. Who cares about precedent anymore? If Jefferson wrote a letter to the Danbury Baptist explaining why there was a separation of church and state, a wall built between the two, um, what does it matter? I mean, that's in the past. Okay, We have to consider what the original intent was, and since Jefferson was an outlier, obviously an atheist, he wrote his own Bible. Yeah. Jefferson pretty much just wrote a Bible that didn't have all of the miracles and all that stuff going on. You know, just down to the brass tacks, like, love your neighbor. Mm -hmm. And apparently, that translation of the Bible, instead of the King James one, which was not political, mind you, because each one of those warring factions and the translation into what we now know as the King James Bible were guided by the hand of God. So therefore, it's all okay. All right? But you can't ascribe that to Jefferson. Don't you dare. All right? That's why I say we need to uh, rid ourselves of these meddlesome priests, and I don't know how to do that. Impeachment is... uh, I don't think that's going to work. I guess it looks like we're stuck with them. Okay. This was an effort that took decades in the making. It did not begin with Donald Trump. But they saw their chance to get what they wanted, and here we are. So is this a Frankenstein monster that's out of control? Or is this exactly what they want? Might be a little bit of both, actually. Uh, I saw an article where... Actually, how many times am I going to use that word in one sentence? I need more sleep, or more coffee, or both. Anyway, back to the brass tacks at hand. I read an article in which wealthy GOP GOP donors are now uh, arraying their efforts and monies against maggot QAnon types who are trying to... Uh, bully their way into our electoral process. So I think that there are maybe some sane people or those who have finally come to their senses. Who said, well, you know, maybe we need to put our money into making sure that we still have a society. Because if you let all these weirdos have their way, you know, (laughs) it's only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time. You know, people are comfortable with, you know, their lifestyles, for the most part, in the, in the loftier climbs. And I think that some more reasonable types are realizing, you know what? If we don't do something, we could lose all this and we don't want to. And they don't. And when I say lose all of that, I mean just a small iota. That's all they want. Oh, speaking of priests, because you do know Ted Cruz comes from a uh, evangelist uh, tent, e- evangelical type. You know, he gives the, the the fiery sermons and whatnot. That's why uh, Ted Cruz sometimes puts on the preacher mode because his dad was a preacher. Anyway, speaking of priests. Ted Cruz was on Fox saying that when these Supreme Court decisions come down, that uh, New York doesn't have any uh, restrictions on guns. They can't put any restrictions on guns. Now, this is how weird this mind works. And he's Ivy League educated, too, apparently. Um, he, He said that that not only that, uh, decision, but also uh, the Roe v. Wade being overturned, that decision, that that would cause all of us commie Antifa woke uh, types to get violent 
and there will be like violence in the streets. <laughs> I just it's, while uh, testimony was being given with uh, those black ladies, uh, election workers in Georgia and elsewhere being terrorized by brown shirts pounding on their doors in the middle of the night. And I don't mean one or two. I mean hundreds. Biker gangs coming in with bullhorns and their big hogs revving it up. And in one instance went into the house of the grandmother of an election worker and terrorized her. So Ted Cruz says, oh, yeah, as soon as we don't get what we want or what we've had, we are going to go into the streets and cause violent mayhem. (sighs) Sometimes people would would wish that could happen sometimes and some people not all. It's just it's astounding because here is Ted Cruz who fomented an insurrection because of a tax break. I'm not getting a tax break. I got to throw overthrow America. The projection is always astounding. I mean, it's not. Or it's uh, yeah, it's not unexpected. I guess it's a double negative in a way. We expect it. Okay, is that better? But it still astounds, even when it's expected. Okay. Well, why don't we get off of this rant, which I've been doing a lot lately. A lot! For a long time, actually, now. But anyway, let's get into the curated part of the show, because we do take the time to curate a show. So what is that curated part of the show? Well, let me tell you, yeah, Trump used his big lie to bludgeon election officials to his will. And not only that, Shay and her mom, Ruby, it wasn't just them that quit that precinct office or election county board there, but everybody did. Every single one. So who gets replaced? Trump stooges. That is the plan. And that is happening across America. Because is it really worth it for your grandparents to volunteer, to check signatures when people are coming in, handing them a ballot? They're going to make voting illegal. Separation of church and state, that's nothing. (laughs) <laughs> you vote, go to jail. Okay. But it seems to be working even though we're exposing it. Let's hope that we can stop it. And by hope, I mean let's do something. And I th- would venture uh, an opinion that the J6 committee is doing quite well in that. So let's continue on. The rest of the menu, the Chevron CEO got bent out of shape when Joe Biden said the oil companies make more money than God. At a time, the oil companies are making more money than God. Facebook signed a deal with the Justice Department to end discriminatory housing ads. And it could take years to rebuild Yellowstone after catastrophic floods... And cost billions. Well, it took a few thousand years or more to make it what it was to begin with, didn't it? I don't know how much that cost. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where Yair Lapid is set to be Israel's next premier, but he faces a critical test. And tens of thousands of railway workers walked off the job in Britain in the country's biggest transit strike in three decades. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit.
page at netrootsradio.com. To the right of the page is the chat room link. And the chat room itself is monitored by Kelly Lincoln, and we thank Kelly for doing so. If you would look across the page from the chat room link to the left there, at or near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, there is the link to our Patreon page. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, it really does help. If you could maybe afford, or can you afford, an espresso-type coffee drink and send those funds our way? Well, if you can, uh, that helps us pay our bills. And I should also add that it's not West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy we're funding here. No, we're talking about Netroots Radio. And your help does greatly impact our ability to bring you shows like the Brad Blog, Democracy Now!, KGRO in the Morning!, Majority Report. <laughs> Do I go on? Uh, our science shows. Uh, archive radio from uh, old time radio back, uh, you know, science fiction and, and radio dramas. Uh, our ability to bring you those shows 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 plus days a year is because of your generosity. And we thank you for that because we've been doing this for 11 years and we do take our jobs. Well, is this a vocation? I don't know. It's not a hobby. I will say we take it very seriously. It is a civic duty and we embrace it wholeheartedly. And that is no joke. And thank you for your help in allowing, or thank you, yes, for your generosity in helping us fulfill that civic duty as the founders originally intended so many years ago. And we, we do like to live by precedent. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. Thanks, Tom. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's 10 minutes before showtime because that is automatic. The variable is me getting it all linked up on Twitter and other social media platforms. But follow me at Twitter at Justice Putnam. Oh, I'm sorry, on Twitter at Justice Putnam. And uh, you you will be able to find those show notes and links to these shows because I got to tell you, that's where the real reportage is Mm -hmm. from real reporters. Follow Netroots. Oh, I'm sorry. Follow the show. I'll get it. Follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, etc., 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 And the deep archive of the Netroots Radio Library is found at the Internet Archive at archive.org. Okay, Josh Boak of the Associated Press, or is that Boak? Josh Boak of the Associated Press brings us this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And appointed back and forth, the head of Chevron complained that President Joe Biden has vilified energy firms at a time when gasoline prices are at near record levels. And the president responded that the oil company CEO was being mildly sensitive. The president in recent weeks has criticized oil producers and refiners for maximizing profits and making more money than God rather than increasing production in response to higher prices as the economy recovers from the pandemic and feels the effects of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Michael Worth, chairman and CEO of Chevron, sent Biden a letter via email that said the president's own words have been self-defeating in terms of encouraging companies to boost their profits. I guess Joe's not being a supplicant enough to them. Chevron is investing in more production, Worth wrote, but, quote, 
Your administration has largely sought to criticize and at times vilify our industry. These actions are not beneficial to meeting the challenges we face and are not what the American people deserve. Well, let me tell you, Mr. CEO, I am the American people and we deserve a lot better than what we're getting from you price gougers maximizing profits. It is price gouging. The oil company CEO said he wanted a more cooperative relationship with the government. Well, that starts with you, buddy. <laughs> Let's work together, Worth wrote. The American people rightly expect our country's leaders and industry to address the challenges they are facing in a serious and resolute manner. Well, you know, you lied about climate change for how many decades? According to your own records. Larry Neumeister of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. Facebook will change its algorithms to prevent discriminatory housing advertising, and its parent company will subject itself to court oversight to settle a lawsuit brought by the U.S. Department of Justice yesterday, Tuesday. In a release... U.S. government officials said it had reached agreement with Meta Platforms, Inc., formerly known as Facebook, to settle the lawsuit filed simultaneously in Manhattan Federal Court. According to the release, it was the Justice Department's first case challenging algorithmic discrimination under the Fair Housing Act. Facebook will now be subject to Justice Department approval and court oversight for its ad targeting and delivery system. U.S. Attorney Damian Williams called the lawsuit groundbreaking. Assistant Attorney General Kristen Clark called it historic. Ashley Settle, a Facebook spokesperson, said in an email that the company was building a novel machine learning method without our ad system that will change the way housing ads are delivered to people residing in the U.S. across different demographic groups. She said the company would extend its new method for ads related to employment and credit in the U.S. We are excited. To pioneer this effort, Settle added in an email. Lindsay Whitehurst and Brian Melly of the Associated Press bring us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Created in 1872 as the United States was recovering from the Civil War, Yellowstone was the first of the national parks that came to be referred to as America's best idea. Now the home to gushing geysers, thundering waterfalls, and some of the country's most plentiful and diverse wildlife is facing its biggest challenge in decades. Floodwaters this week wiped out numerous bridges, washed out miles of roads, and closed the park as it approached peak tourist season 
during its 150th anniversary celebration. Nearby communities were swamped and hundreds of homes flooded as the Yellowstone River and its tributaries raged. The scope of the damage is still being tallied by Yellowstone officials, but based on other national park disasters, it could take years and cost upwards of over $1 billion to rebuild in an environmentally sensitive landscape where construction season only runs from the spring thaw until the first snowfall. Based on what park officials have revealed and AP images and video taken from a helicopter, the greatest damage seemed to be to roads, particularly on the highway connecting the park's northern entrance in Gardner, Montana, to the park's offices in Mammoth Hot Springs. Large sections of the road were undercut and washed away as the Gardner River jumped its banks. Perhaps hundreds of foot bridges on trails may have been damaged or destroyed. This is not going to be an easy rebuild, Superintendent Cam Shawley said early in the week as he highlighted photos of massive, ga massive gaps of roadway in the steep canyon. I do not think it's going to be smart to invest potentially, you know, tens of millions of dollars of however much it is into repairing a road that may be subject to seeing a similar flooding event in the future. Reestablishing a human imprint in a national park is always a delicate operation, especially as a changing climate makes natural disasters more likely. Increasingly, intense wildfires are occurring, inclu including one last year that destroyed bridges, cabins, and other infrastructure in Lassen Volcanic National Park in Northern California. Flooding has already done extensive damage in other parks and is a threat to virtually all the more than 400 national parks. Mount Rainier National Park in Washington State closed for six, six months after the worst flooding in its history in 2006. Damage to roads, trails, campgrounds, and buildings was estimated at, at that time, $36 million. Yosemite Valley in California's Yosemite National Park has flooded several times, but suffered its worst damage 25 years ago when heavy downpours on top of a large snowpack submerged campgrounds, flooded hotel rooms, washed out bridges and sections of road and knocked out power and sewer lines. The park was closed for more than two months. Congress allocated $178 million in emergency funds, a massive sum for park infrastructure at the time, and additional funding eventually surpassed $250 million, according to a 2013 report. And Yosemite could have cost more than a billion. My, my, my. All right, let's get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. This week, dinosaurs are back on fast food ads. Four years after the disaster on Dino Island, Universal is back with the $185 million Jurassic World Dominion. Dinosaurs now roam the Earth and interact with humans, but for the formula here to keep working, there has to be some physical entity where well-intentioned but ultimately corrupt things transpire. In this one, that's the Biosyn Corporation, located in the Dolomite Mountains of Italy, which is under the tutelage of the aggressive, unethical, and recognizable Dr. Dodgson, who's still dedicated to the lofty ideals of genetic tinkering to benefit mankind. 
because that's worked out so well before. The suspicion here is that biosin has resurrected some prehistoric locusts, which don't eat biosin crops but do eat everything else, shout out Monsanto, and which threaten the world's food supply. With evil afoot, especially Biosyn's interest in Owen Grady's secret clone daughter and pet velociraptor, the action is set. A lot of what follows is now termed fan service. While there's a lack of suspense in the usual sense here, there is some suspense or at least interest in how the various characters from the 30-year arc of the franchise will interact in the face of new challenges. I mean, what fan doesn't want to see what an aging Jeff Goldblum's character is up to, if Owen and Claire are getting on any better, or how Maisie is growing up? There's a wonderful chase scene through Malta, and the dinosaurs look better than ever, but leaps in technology don't make up for leaps in the plot, or the huh-what 10-second solution to that whole world food supply issue thing. Jurassic World Dominion is what it is, and because of so many people like me who've seen the other movies, it's turned that 185 mil into over 500 at press time. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. Have you ever wondered what the world looks like from the eyes of animals? An Immense World, written and read by Pulitzer Prize-winning science journalist Ed Yong, takes us on a fascinating journey that will transform the way you see the world. Through every animal's unique sensory bubble, we learn what bees see in flowers, what songbirds hear in their tunes, and what dogs smell on the street. An Immense World is steeped with science, but suffused with magic. An Immense World by Ed Young is available everywhere audiobooks are sold. Why would a normally developing girl stop walking? What causes a middle-aged person to lose their sense of balance? Dr. Huda Zogby has devoted her career to unraveling these puzzles. She shares the Kavli Prize with Jean-Louise Mandel, Harry Orr, and Christopher Walsh for discovering the genetic pathways behind serious brain disorders. Scientific American Custom Media, in partnership with the Kavli Prize, spoke with Huda to learn more about her research. The Kavli Prize is a prestigious honor on its own, but the award holds a special place in Dr. Huda Zogby's heart. Because it recognizes work that I have so cherished. It is work with my longtime collaborator, Harry Orr. And I so cherish the work as well as our relationship over the years. So to me, this was the sweetest way to recognize that work. Huda and Professor Harry Orr both received the Kavli Prize this year for research that has been intertwined for decades. Our collaboration has outlasted most American marriages. It all started when Huda was at the very beginning of her career. She was trying to unravel the genetic cause of a disorder that affected the balance and speech of a large family in Texas. At around 40 years old, affected family members... will start feeling a little bit off balance if they're making a quick move. Slowly, their speech becomes slurred. And that gets worse and worse with time. Eventually, the family members lose their ability to walk and talk clearly. They typically die around 20 years later of causes related to breathing or swallowing problems. The disorder is known as spinocelebellar ataxia type 1, or SCA1. It's a family with 200 members, and I started immediately driving every few days to Montgomery and collecting samples. With the samples Huda gathered and the help of her colleagues, she discovered that the gene responsible for SEA1 was located on chromosome 6. But she still had a long way to go. Imagine you mapped it to the state of Texas, right? And now you're going to find where the house is. So we had to really get the map closer and closer and narrow in to get close to it. Time passed, and she finally started getting closer to the location of the gene. Let's say she'd located the city. She also discovered that Professor Harry Orr at the University of Minnesota was studying a similar disorder in the same general area of chromosome 6. I read papers by him showing that we are in the same city. 
And I was like, wow, this guy is impressive. He's done all this work. They eventually met and started sharing information. But over time, it became clear that they were looking at genes in different locations. By then, Harry had an inkling that his gene is towards one side, let's say the north, at most northern side of the city. And I had data to suggest it's at the southern side of the city. So we're far apart. Huda learned a complicated technique to create little addresses or markers on chromosome 6 to better locate her gene. And she thought, why not share them with Harry? So I called him up and I said, look, I made those hybrids. If you want to use them, please go ahead and take them. And he was like, great. So we're communicating. We're having really beautiful, cordial relationship. Huda went on with her research, but she had this nagging thought in the back of her brain. I think there's something fishy here. How could it be that she and Harry were studying two different diseases if both had similar symptoms with a genetic cause in the same general region of chromosome 6? I kept pushing and pushing. Eventually, who would have found a mistake in the data from the family she was studying? Everyone had assumed a group of daughters inherited SCA1 from their mother. But it turns out it was actually the father who passed the disorder to his girls. Huda quickly worked with a technician to rerun some of her experiments. Cataloging everything for all the branch of this family to construct what came from dad, what came from mom. And when we did that, it fell on top of Harry's gene. She immediately called Harry. I said, Harry, I use this marker. It puts it right on top of your gene. We're working on the same disease. Huda was relieved, but Harry was worried. Because back then, cloning a disease gene was a big deal. Everybody wanted the glory to themselves. Harry asked if Huda wanted him to return the resources she shared with him. I said, no, 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 no. You keep them. We work together. Now we really collaborate. Now we're working on the same thing. 15 seconds of silence. And he said, let's do it. When Huda and Harry combined their data, they were able to narrow the location of their gene down to about 1 million base pairs. They slowly examined each gene, one at a time. But then Huda heard a scientific talk about a disorder that was marked by repeating letters of DNA. I said, Harry, we're not going to walk gene by gene. I just heard this awesome talk from Tom Kasky, and it's a, these three bases of DNA that repeat. Let's just ignore everything else and focus on finding repeats. So... She and Harry divided their genes up, including a little bit of overlap, and started hunting. A few weeks later, on the same day... April 8, 1993, he sent me a fax. He discovered the mutation in his family, and I sent him a fax. I discovered the mutation in my family. Huda and Harry have been working together ever since. Before Huda submits a grant proposal, she always lets Harry know. Harry, I'm going to do this, this, and this. And he goes, perfect. I'm not doing any of that. I will write a letter to assure the reviewers and to tell them how I will help you. And I do the same for him. Between them, they've discovered that the gene responsible for SEA1 produces a protein called a taxin 1 that causes clumps in the brain and leads to that loss of balance. They've also developed a new type of treatment that improves SEA1 symptoms in mice. It's a rare collaboration in a world that's highly competitive. What made them do it? I don't think either of us really thought about who's going to get credit. Honestly, we just wanted to solve this problem. And I think that was the driver. Also, they were young. I would say most of my good decisions were due to naivety. You know, trust your heart and don't overthink it. Really. Huda says this collaboration has deepened their knowledge, not just of SEA1, but other neurological disorders like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. And my long-term vision is prevention. And I'm excited about venturing in that area and finding things that we can maybe take a small pill for that's safe for people who had a family history of disease or had a risk genotype. Her work with Harry is already being used in clinical trials for treating SCA1 and other disorders. Her advice for scientists that want to follow in her path? Be patient. Everybody looks at me and gets excited because of the big discovery. I want to remind everybody, 
there were years for each of these discoveries. And that's okay. Huda says in science, it might take a long time for success to come. But when it does, it's so satisfying, especially when it's shared with a good friend. Dr. Huda Zogby is a professor at Baylor College of Medicine, the director of the Jan and Dan Duncan Neurological Research Institute at Texas Children's Hospital, and an investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. This year, she shared the Kavli Prize in neuroscience with Harry Orr, Jean-Louis Mandel, and Christopher Walsh. The Kavli Prize honors scientists for breakthroughs in astrophysics, nanoscience, and neuroscience, transforming our understanding of the big, the small, and the complex. The Kavli Prize is a partnership among the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters, the Norwegian Ministry of Education and Research, and the U.S.-based Kavli Foundation. This work was produced by Scientific American Custom Media and made possible through the support of the Kavli Prize. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetrootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power Netroots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of NetrootsRadio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. Welcome to 60 Second Civics from the Center for Civic Education. I'm Mark Gage. Being a citizen of the United States means fulfilling certain personal, political, and economic responsibilities. Personal responsibilities include taking care of yourself and your family and making sure that they receive a proper education. Political responsibilities are those that we most often think of as being the obligations of citizenship, such as serving on a jury, registering for the draft, staying informed about the issues so that you can cast a responsible vote, and supporting the common good rather than exclusively your own interests. Economic responsibilities include supporting yourself and your family, spending responsibly, dealing fairly with other people in financial matters, and paying taxes. The American system relies on the informed and reasoned political decisions of the American people, but it also depends on the willingness of all of us to make responsible decisions that support the common good in our daily lives. This episode is made possible by the support of T-Mobile. 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1977. The eyes of the British labor movement were turned to the Grunwick Film Labor Processing Laboratories in northwest London. Members of trade unions participated in a large demonstration at the factory. Miners from as far away as South Wales traveled to show their solidarity. As police tried to bring in buses of scabs, the picketers and the police clashed. The bloody scenes played on television sets across the country. The workers at the plant had been on strike since late summer of 1976. They were demanding the right of union recognition. The majority of the workers were women from Southern Asia. The company intentionally hired these women in an effort to keep wages low. One striker explained, Imagine how humiliating it was for us, particularly for older women, to be working and to overhear the employer say to a younger English girl, You don't want to come and work here, love? We won't be able to pay you the sort of wages that'll keep you here, while we had to work there because we were trapped. The strike had started when a man was fired for working too slowly. A small group of his co-workers walked off the job in protest. From there, the strike grew, catching the attention of the broader British labor movement. This strike marked an important turning point, as British trade unionists supported a predominantly South Asian workforce. Earlier strikes by South Asian workers had not received similar support. Despite this show of solidarity, the company remained entrenched, battling vehemently against the recognition of the union. The women at the plant fought for two years, until the strike was called off. The end of the protracted battle was seen as a major blow to labor. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com. Like us on Facebook and follow us on the Twitters at Labor History in Two.
Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 62 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting a high of about the same as yesterday, which was about 92 degrees, maybe a tad higher. And it looks like uh, we are still on track for uh, temperatures over 100 for the weekend. We have sunny conditions throughout the day with winds out of the north-northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Clear to partly cloudy overnight. Lows in the upper 50s, low 60s. Winds out of the northwest at 5 to 10. And partly cloudy skies tomorrow with highs actually coming down to the mid 80s. Winds out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. But Friday, it looks like we're going back up into the mid-90s and then 102 to 105 over the weekend. How nice. Confirmed cases of coronavirus and deceased in Jackson County have not been updated, as I have mentioned before. But I will tell you that our totals now stand or continue to stand at Uh, Confirmed cases at 456,014, and our deceased is at 548. Grass pollen is very high uh, right outside the window here in Rogue River. The air quality index for the Rogue River Valley region is good, and it came down a little bit at 25 parts per million, and the daytime UV index is very high at level 9. Barometric pressure is holding steady at 30.1 inches. Visibility is at 9 miles and relative humidity is at 88%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 80 degrees and sunny. Paris is 80 degrees and partly cloudy with a electrical storm advisory that could impact critical electrical infrastructure. Rome is 90 degrees and fair. Kiev is 66 and mostly cloudy. Kabul is 55 and cloudy. Hong Kong is 84 degrees and fair. Tokyo is 72 and cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 51 degrees and clear. San Francisco, California is 60 degrees and sunny, and New York, New York is 66 degrees Fahrenheit and cloudy. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Joseph Fetterman of the Associated Press brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. In a 10-year political career, Israel's Yair Lapid has transformed himself from an upstart political novice to a feisty opposition leader to the savvy operator who toppled Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. And next week, he is expected to assume his biggest role yet as the new prime minister. Following the government's decision to dissolve parliament, Lapid, now foreign minister, is set to take office as caretaker prime minister until elections in the fall. It will be a critical test for Lapid, aged 58, who will try to convince Israelis he is worthy of the top office as he takes on a resurgent Netanyahu. Officially, the two men were announcing the end of their year-old government, an alliance of eight diverse parties that was severely weakened by months of infighting and rebellion. 
but in many ways, Lapide sounded like he was beginning his next campaign. In a swipe at Netanyahu, is on, who is on trial for corruption charges, he vowed to stand against the forces threatening to turn Israel into a non-democratic country. Sounds familiar, huh? Netanyahu, believing he is the victim of a political witch hunt, has made clear he intends to take on the country's legal and law enforcement establishment if he returns to power. Well, that's resonating around the world, too, isn't it? A former author, columnist, news anchor, bank pitchman, and amateur boxer, Lapide left a successful career as a media personality to enter politics in 2012 as head of a new centrist party popular with middle-class Israelis. He promised economic relief an end to controversial draft exemptions for seminary students, and a more moderate approach to Palestinians. Unlike the right-wing parties that dominate Israel's political system, Lapid favors peace talks, leading to an eventual two-state solution with the Palestinians, although it is unclear if he will ever have the kind of mandate needed to engage in such a process. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Jill Wallace of the AP brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Tens of thousands of railway workers walked off the job in Britain yesterday, Tuesday, bringing the train network to a crawl in the country's biggest transit strike for three decades and a potential precursor to a summer of labor discontent. About 40,000 cleaners, signalers, maintenance workers, and station staff held a 24-hour strike with two more planned for Thursday and another on Saturday. Compounding the pain for commuters, London underground subway services were also hit by a walkout yesterday, Tuesday as well. The dispute centers on pay, working conditions, and job security as Britain's railways struggle to adapt to travel and commuting habits changed, perhaps forever, by the coronavirus pandemic. With passenger numbers still not back to pre-pandemic levels, but the government ending emergency support that kept the railways afloat, train companies are seeking to cut costs and staffing. Sustained national strikes are uncommon in Britain these days, but unions have warned the country to brace for more as workers face the worst cost-of-living squeeze in more than a generation. Lawyers in England and Wales have announced they will walk out starting next week, while unions representing teachers and postal workers both plan to consult their members about possible actions. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on. And we will meet up here tomorrow for Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A little bit of jambalaya, a little bit of spice in your life. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow, right here. In West Coast, cookbook and speakeasy. Bon appétit.
Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des TF Des photos de bord de mer Demain jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Jardin d'hiver Ma robe à fleurs Sous la pluie de novembre Tes mains qui coulent Je n'en peux plus de t'attendre Les années passent Il est loin, là je tombe Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 